Howdy, neighbors. Won't you be my neighbor? Say, so, yeah, that's fine until you move in next door. I know how it is. Good to see everybody here tonight. Welcome. If you're watching online and listening online, we we hope that this will be a treat for you. We have uh, some microphones hung up tonight so that we'll be able to um, actually engage and have people talking, and you should be able to hear them, we hope, uh, unless they say something that we don't want them to say, and then we're going to you know, do that to the back. But I think we're going to be okay. I think it's going to give us an opportunity to uh, uh, to really engage, and then you won't have these drive places listening, and you won't hear, know what's going on, and everybody just kind of sitting there. And So that's good. It's going to be a good night. So welcome, everybody. So let's go to the Lord this, this evening. Father, we thank you so much for our time together. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to come share your word. Lord, that we, the opportunity that we have to um, just grow together closer to you and closer to one another. So we pray, Lord, that you will bless this time together and just give us wisdom and discernment as we study your word, that we, uh, we actually feast upon it, Lord, that it becomes our nourishment for our spirit, Lord, and our soul. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you'll open Isaiah chapter 30, we're going to pick up in verse 18 this week. So in our last study, we, we saw that Judas, Judah was um, rebellious. It seemed like I don't really need to open that way. It's pretty much the same way every week. Uh, that they were in a rebellious state against the Lord, and, and they were only seeking prophets and seeking people to speak things to them that they wanted to hear. They didn't want to seek out godly prophets they didn't want to seek out anything from the lord they just really wanted as we touched on last time you know they're, they're tickling ears whatever they wanted to hear and this microphone now is uh starting to drop on me so we're going to see if i can't keep that up this way but a true prophet should only speak what the lord gives him to speak and that's something that you know translated even in today you know we need to make sure if someone comes and they speak a word of prophecy that we pray over it we don't shut it down and say, oh, no, that's not the Lord. I don't believe you. We say, okay, if that's from the Lord, then he's going to bear witness to my spirit, and I'm going to know that that's from the Lord, and I'm going to receive it. And if it's not from the Lord, I'm going to reject it. And that's how we should all live our lives today. And it is, uh, you know, sometimes I've, I've, I've seen prophecy in the churches today. They, they tend to be light and fluffy, pro you know, uh, prophecies. You know, oh, blessings and peace and money and prosperity and, and, and all of these things, but... I, I, I kind of find it hard to believe that that there's not some word of, hey, you know, this is what the Lord says. We need to straighten up. We need to do this. We need to do that. But I don't hear a lot of that in, in the, in the uh, churches today as far as some of the prophetic ministries. And, again, you know, I pray that God would just lead those as he sees fit and that as prophet, uh, prophets speak, that they speak truth. For the church today needs to be seeking truth above all else. We need to be in the Word. We need to be seeking truth in the Spirit and allowing the Spirit without uh, hindering Him, without quenching the Spirit, we want the Spirit to move. And so we open, we open that and we say, Lord, move in the way you want to. It's your church. This is your body. This is your place. This is, this is who we are, and we want you to move in us as you see fit. So getting back to what Judah was going through, again, they were just looking for, um, for good, fluffy prophecies. Now, this week, we're going to see the heart of God. The wonderful thing that we can see consistently as God deals with Israel and deals with Judah throughout the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah as well and other prophetic books, as you go through the books, you see how God does speak harsh judgment, but he also shows his mercy. God is a merciful God, and he wants to show mercy. He desires to show mercy to his people. But he knows the heart of the people, too. And one thing about a God who knows all, we can't come and fool him. We can't come and say, hey, you know, we're, 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 we're repenting. We're going to be good now from now on. And God said, yeah, I, I've heard that one before. You know, what was it, yesterday? And so we have to come and we have to say, okay, well, Lord, then we want to be purified. We want to be holy before you because you say, be holy for I am holy. We know that it's your holiness. We know it's your righteousness that pours into us, we know that because of that, we now have all we need to walk in holiness. 
it really comes down to the choices that we make moment by moment and day by day. Are we going to walk in obedience or are we going to walk in rebellion? And so what we're going to see today as we get into this study that there, there's judgment that he's been speaking up to this point, but there's also fully in, in the full end of time, there's going to be the remnant. We know what the remnant is because you can go to Revelation and see there's 12,000 from each tribe. And that is going to be the ultimate final remnant. Now, there'll be Jewish people that are saved between now and then. But as far as the nation of Israel goes, there'll be 12,000 of each tribe. And they will be 144,000. And anybody who looks at that, that scripture differently, then they're just, they're just casting out what is said right before. I mean, it's very specific about who those, uh, the 144,000 are. So let's pick up in verse 18. Uh, this evening, and, uh, and we go from here. And again, this is a interactive study, so I'm going to pause. I'm going to give you opportunity to share, and, and uh, anything you, you, you want to bring to the table, bring it on. So verse 18 of Isaiah chapter 30. Therefore the Lord will wait, that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted, that me ha he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice, and blessed are all those who wait for him, for the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. So first question I want to pose tonight is, what do we see about the character of God in these verses? He gives grace to the humble. Absolutely. Anything else? Very patient with his rebellious children. Amen. He really is. And we saw that consistently all the way from the time that they came out of Egypt and all the way till to today in the church. We see how patient God is with his people. And so when we see this, we see that his character, see one thing about God's character is he's fully perfect in every attribute that he has. He's perfect in his mercy because he desires to have mercy upon us. He knows when and how he's going to do that. He's perfect in when he does it. He's also perfect in his sovereignty. He knows all, so therefore he acts accordingly to knowing all. The problem that we have is we think we know more than we know more times than not. And when we put ourselves in that position of saying, well, God, I just don't know why you don't do it this way. Or I don't know why you didn't do it that way. And you're just not seeing what's going on down here. I mean, I just don't understand. What? Hello? And this is the mind. I mean, you know, we don't act out quite like that really out front. But subconsciously, that's really what we're saying and what we're thinking. It's like, God, you must not be, be alert right now because... This would be a simple fix if you just do it. But he's perfect in all of the attributes. His sovereignty, his all-knowing, his all-present. He's present all the time. He's always with us. And then, of course, his mercy and his grace, his judgment, all perfectly balanced. And this is something that we can depend upon because God does not change. And so as God is ever consistent with us we're the ones that drift we're the ones that we we find ourselves out of sync with him he never changes he never moves if he does move he's carrying us with us where he's going but we tend to find ourselves lagging behind or ahead or off somewhere in left field just saying hey look at the pretty flowers whatever it might be but we need to make sure that we always understand that God is perfect in all of his characteristics and in this particular pay, place He's faithful in his mercy. He says, blessed are all those who wait for him. You will weep no more, and he will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. So many times, God is waiting for a repentant cry. Many times, he's waiting for, for us to get to that point to where we're, it's over. We, I mean, we, we, we have nothing else but to cry out to the Lord. And that's what he wants us to do. That's what he longed for. And we even see that with Jesus speaking to Jerusalem. And, and in our Sunday message, uh, if we get that far, which I think we will, uh, the last verse that we'll be studying in Matthew, uh, in the chapter that we're in, is that basically he laments over Jerusalem. And he laments and he's, he's, he's grieving 
over them. You know, how I long for you to come back to me. How I long for you to be in my presence, but you would not. And so we see that God is perfect in all of his ways. He's very gracious. He's very merciful. And one other aspect is he's also faithful to his word. So if he says he's going to be merciful, he'll be merciful. When it's time for judgment, there'll be judgment. Whatever needs to be done in his perfect timing will be done. But he's faithful to his word. He lays it out so perfectly in Second Chronicles 7, mm-hmm. 14, where he says that my peoples will call on my name. And then he says, if they humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll heal them from heaven and heal their land. It's simple. It is And simple. it's never changed. Right. That's all we have to do. Yeah. Why is it so hard for us? <laughs> yeah, it, it's amazing why we make it so hard. Yeah. You know, and, and it's really what it really, really comes down to is pride and self-centeredness. Yes. Because, yeah, we want to do that. It's simple. The, you know, it, it's not a formula. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this. If you do this, you get this yeah. result. That's not what no. we're talking about. But the scriptures do tell us if we repent and we humble ourselves, he will hear our cry and he will restore us. Now, when we read that passage, particularly, it is talking about Israel, and it is talking about them as a nation. Now, what we have here in our country today is we have a country that is not a Christian nation. We have Christian people, but it's not a Christian nation as we stand. The the government that we have does not honor God. And so even though believers are seeking repentance on our government's behalf, and it's okay to do that, by the way. We saw that in many prayers in the Old Testament, Nehemiah prayed and repented for the ancestors. He repented for his father. He repented for all of those who had turned against God. So it's okay that we go to the Lord and get on knees and say, Lord, we, I repent on their behalf, even if they don't know what they're doing. I repent. And we call out to God. We don't know that he may intervene in some way in this land if he's not done with us for who we are as a nation. We don't know. Again, we have to be very careful because... Our eyes and our ears only hear to see what we hear and see. And if you listen to the news, it's all over. I mean, because they have absolutely no ability to to know who God is or, or won't speak of him in, in the way of who he is. So, you know, you can't get any information around us in the world today and try to apply that to God's word and say, oh, this is happening here and this is happening there. It is happening, but he's still on a timeline. And who knows what he's going to do to maybe slow things down or speed things up you know I mean we don't know only God knows if he gives us word of knowledge if he gives us prophetic words and they're from him they will come true if the Lord speaks to anyone and says hey this is what I'm doing and this is why it's happening and this is going to happen and it's God speaking through them then it's going to happen now what we have right now is we have the actual consequences of our actions going on just like Judah had their consequences They had all the consequences of their sin. But even in that, we see God is merciful. So what we're praying for is his will to be done. We pray the prayer like you just just shared with us about praying and seeking the Lord, repenting and coming to him humbly. All of that, that should be a regular thing for the church. It shouldn't be just when we get in trouble. But unfortunately, as most of the time it is, and we even see here, when he hears the sound of our cry, but it's got to be a cry out of humility. It's got to be a cry out of, of complete and utter, we can't do anything. It's you, Lord. It's all you. And like I said, this is an attitude that we should always have. So, but, but it is very simple. When you, when, you, when you mention it, it's very simple that if all the believers today were to put down whatever it is that, that they've got going religiously, and seek him for who he is and repent for all the other stuff we've attached to it, who knows what God might do? Mm-hmm. Who knows what God might do? So, and it could be a wonderful thing in the moment. Yes? So, so uh, um, Pastor, the, uh, um, I was sharing with Debbie today about something I was reading today about uh, the passage that goes, uh, uh, many are called, but mm-hmm. you, are, you, you are chosen. Yeah. And so the gospel is Mm-hmm. But if you ignore it and you use the loud distractions and stuff get in your way, you're you're one of the few chosen. Yeah. You know, and I thought that was so awesome. And you you wrote that song, you 
you might cry. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. what, what you're saying about the cry and stuff kind of goes along with the song you wrote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's that and that song is specifically out of scripture. Yeah. It's 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 a specific it's a scripture song and and so this is the heart that we should have and we sh and that's another way of praying is through the scriptures pray the scriptures particularly the psalms particularly in different places if god gives it to you pray it and pray it out loud god loves to hear his word quoted and prayer put in prayers why because it's a perfect word we sometimes want to try to rewrite it but if it's already well written let's go with it <laughs> let's take it as it is and go with it and go from there so we see god he's perfect in his character in his mercy and his grace and he's faithful to his word now revelation 7 16 through 17 kind of gives us a picture too of, of 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 this picture coming to the fullness of in revelation 7 16 uh, through 17 they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore the sun shall not strike them nor any heat for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe, wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, this is a promise. This is a, a this, if you want to be into prosperity, this is a prosperity you want. Mm -hmm. This is what we are going to have when we were with Jesus. This is what Judah, the, the remnant of Judah and Israel are going to have. When they're, when they're with Jesus, it's going to be a beautiful place where there's not going to be any of these things that are coming at us here. You know, you go outside and you walk out, your glasses fog up because you can't see nothing because you've been in air conditioning all day. You know, I wonder what we would do today if we did go back without air conditioning. I know, I, I mean, I, my parents talk about it all the time. Oh, we didn't have no, we didn't have inside running water. You know, went barefooted in the snow both ways, uphill <laughs> yeah. to school. Yeah. You know? But... But the thing is, is that it's, uh, you know, this is what we, this is a promise that we have. We, he's going to give us this kind of peace, this kind of joy, this kind of comfort. And nothing that we're going through now is even going to be, is even going to be remembered. It's just going to be Jesus and a reflection of who we are in him. So that's who God is speaking of in these verses. He's actually speaking about Judah and Israel as a whole when he's talking in Revelation here. He's also talking to the church, but he's, he's talking to, um, to Judah as we see that too. This is a promise that they're going to have. And they're speaking of the sealed, Israel, sealed of Israel who will come out of the tribulation period. Now verses 20 and 21. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore. But your eyes shall see their teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left, you will also defile the covering of your images of silver and the ornament of your molded images of gold. You will throw them away as an unclean thing. You will say to them, Get away. So, any comments on these two verses? What do you see here? I'm just having a little difficulty on the first blush to understand what Isaiah is referring to as your teachers in verse 20. Mm -hmm. Is he saying the, this is kind of like these idols are their former masters and now they're going to get rid of them? Their repentance, in their repentance, they're going to get rid of them and throw them away and not listen to them anymore? So a little well, I, 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 that could be one way of looking at it. I think when you get to the end, it's talking of the, of the, um, <coughs> of the idols. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's actually verse 22. In verse 20, uh, I believe when it's talking about your teachers, it's talking about their prophets. Because right now, you know, up to this point, when we read up to this point, they pushed them aside. Right. They only wanted this prophet say wanted to hear from him. It wasn't, it wasn't, so they pushed them away into a corner, if you will. And now it says your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. So you're going to be looking for them and listening to them. That's the way I would interpret verse 1 of that one. They're no longer going to be pushed aside. And another thing I like to 
22, verse, uh, verse 20, um, and this goes against, uh, like a lot of people think of this, uh, this gender is a feel-good, uh, happy, happy, happy uh, walk. But yet it says, and the Lord gives you the bread of adversity mm -hmm. and the water of affliction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, you know, when those things happen or whatever else, you just, just know that they're going to happen. I mean, you, if you are coming to Christianity or coming to the Lord and stuff because you're trying to get away from problems or, com or other things and stuff like that, you got the wrong people. Yeah. But bread and water are nourishing. So we who are here tonight have been through adversity and we've learned through it. We've grown through it. Grown through it. And that's that's I think what he's calling us to do. It's gonna it's gonna come to you. Mm -hmm. And he tells us, you're gonna suffer. Right. But bread and water are nourishing. So it, it nourishes our soul and our spirit so that we can follow him. Right. Absolutely. So so we see that God uses adversity mm -hmm. and affliction. And he uses it to bring people back to him. Mm -hmm. Over and over and over when, when Israel would turn from God, he brought affliction to them. Mm -hmm. They went into bondage. And then when they would cry out after the time was done and his time was up, he would hear their cry and he would bring them out of that bondage. But he uses that to bring people back to him. Um, now, and, it, and it's, it is interesting because, again, you know, as Norman was saying, and, you know, this specifically says, though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. Again, there are some today that say only Satan can bring any affliction on you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what the Word says. The Bible says specifically God can and does bring affliction. Mm -hmm. But it's for His purpose. It's not to harm us. The difference between what Satan brings at us and what God brings upon us is Satan is to destroy us, to kill, steal, and destroy. God's purpose is to get us through it, that we die to our flesh... And then we live to him, and then we grow, and we become more and more like him. And that's pretty much what, um, what this is talking about here. So there are times when God will bring that upon us. I mean, again, you know, you can even go back to Job, and that's a big discussion. It was Satan that did it. Okay? We all know it was Satan who did it, but he had to ask God's permission. And who even brought Job up to, to Satan? Yeah. Have you considered Job? God says. So you you got to look at this in the in the full context of what we're talking about. Again, but God is perfect in all of His ways. If He allows something, if He brings something, it's going to be for our good if we're trying, if we're seeking Him, if we're desiring Him, and we can grow we, we grow closer to Him through that. Yeah. Is verse twenty one the Holy Spirit? Would that be like the, the precursor to the Holy Spirit that's that's speaking to your ear, that's instructing you in the way. I think for us today, it definitely can be the Holy Spirit. You know, the Word itself could be, uh, be what it's talking about. In their day, I believe it was still, I think that's still grouped in with the prophets because they will hear a voice of the prophet hearing them. They're looking for them. They're seeing them. They're no longer tucked away in the corner. They're listening to them, and they're going to hear that voice. And it may be a very quiet voice, walk in this way. Walk in this way. Um, and that's, that's something that's, you know, and again, we have the Holy Spirit. And I believe he speaks to us very clearly sometimes. And, I mean, we've all had checks in our spirit. When we're in a place we're not supposed to be, when we're doing something we're not supposed to be doing, or heading in a direction that we're not supposed to go. And, and it may not be a bad thing. It may not be a sinful thing. It's just not what God has for us. And then you, you hear that, you just get a check in your spirit. I don't think I should do that. That's the Holy Spirit. And so he speaks to us. But even today, speaking of the gifts of the Spirit, he could use a prophet. He could use someone to come and speak a word of knowledge and give us that information that we need and we can hear it. So it could be a combination of a lot of ways. But yeah, today I believe it definitely can be the Holy Spirit. And even then, it's the Holy Spirit that was moving upon the prophets to speak what needed to be spoke and, and say what needed to be said. Maybe we hear better then when there's adversity in versus when everything's going well. Yeah. That's a good point. That is a very good point. Yeah, like all yeah. these uh, candlelight vigils after these tragedies that have happened where <coughs> even little children have been gunned down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's hard. I mean, the world we live in is hard. It's a very, very difficult 
upside down world that we live in and we are dependent upon God in everything it's the food the clothing the work the finances the health all of that is in God's hands I mean Jesus spoke it very clearly why do you worry about what you'll wear what you're going to eat do you not know that God if he takes care of the sparrow he's going to take care of you he's got his, he knows every hair on your head some of us he doesn't have to count as many as others just looking around I'm one of them but this is, this is all part of the relationship that we have see and that's the wonderful thing about who we are in Christ today it's not about religion it is about relationship and relationship means it's a two way thing we're communicating with God and he's communicating with us primarily through his word through his spirit and sometimes he will use affliction sometimes he will give us that bread of adversity and the water of affliction any other thoughts on this well we know that it says here that you will um, defile the covering of your images of silver and the ornament of your molded images of gold you will throw them away as an unclean thing you will say to them, get away. Now, he is speaking very, he's speaking very literally of, of idols, figurines, whatever they created and they worship and all those things. But today, for us, sometimes that affliction, the adversity and the affliction that comes, it causes us to see what we have idolized in our life. It may not be a gold image or a silver image. It could be money. It could be relationships. If we've elevated an individual in a relationship above God, then we have made that an idol. And so what he says is, you'll throw it away as an unclean thing. Now, he's not talking about divorcing and throwing away your relationship with your spouse. What he's saying is, is he's going to break you down to where you put it into the right perspective in those things. But I will tell you this. As a believer, if money is your idol, he very well might take it away from you. And when you get your attention to the point do you say, I really don't care, then that's, and, 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 and you're willing to cast it away. We talked about that here a few weeks back. You know, it's very, it's very easy for us to say, hey, you know, Lord, if you take everything I've got, I'll worship you. But it's a whole other thing to say, Lord, I give you everything I've got and follow you. That was the rich, rich young ruler's problem. He came. God didn't, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to take this from you. He said, are you willing to give it up? And he went away remorseful. He went away sad. Because he didn't want to give away his stuff. Yeah. And that's an idol. Yeah. Now, yes? One thing about, talk about idols and stuff like that. Okay, um, hang on one second. Can you, can you talk into the mic? This one's not working. Oh, okay, never mind then. <laughs> so, uh, um, about idols, I was, um, uh, some people did, uh, who did our trees, um, and the Holy Spirit um, uh, told me to pray for the guy, the guy that was uh, there, and he was, you know, and I said, uh, can I pray for you? And uh, he says, well, I got uh, St. Christopher's medal on. Oh. Mm. And I said, oh, okay, what's well, nice, I'm gonna pray for you. And so I prayed for him anyways, and then it's like, that's never happened to him before, and he was like, wow, I like that. Mm. You know, and I said, and you can pray for, too. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, there could be a whole lot of freedom that was set forth in that individual's life at that very moment yeah. because he's never had that type of thing where he was being prayed for. Yeah. And instead, he had this medal. And if this medal is supposed to be whatever it does, a rosary beads, whatever they do, yeah. I don't know. I, the point I'm making is, is it's not about any of that stuff. Right. It's all about Jesus and the relationship that we have. So we see the eyes are open, they'll cast away their, their idols and their folly, and again, we see God keeps his word. In Isaiah 44, 23 through 25, it reads, Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. And I love the way it says that. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Now, does that really transfer into our minds today? 
when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and we turn our hearts and minds over our lives over to him it's a done deal yeah we have to go through the challenges of this world we have to go through the fleshly situation that we're in this tent and all the things that come along with it but it is done and Jesus said, abide in me as I abide in you. And if we abide in him, it's done. It's a done deal. And this is so encouraging that we can take this today and, and understand that our relationship with God, it's, it's done. It, it's not done in the spirit realm. Well, um, excuse me. It's not, it is done in the spirit realm. It's not done in the fleshly realm yet. And we still got to go through the stuff. But when we plow through this, this short little period of life that we're here, and it literally is a tiny, not even a measurable drop in a bucket in comparison to eternity. I, I guess I struggle so much with why do we hang on? Why do, why do we think so much about not wanting to die? Now, I'm not saying we should all be morbid and say, okay, I want to die now, Lord, take me now. It's not what I'm saying. But when we do have situations in our life and we have illnesses and we have things that do continue to, to develop and get worse, why do we not look at that as a joyous thing? As a believer, now I'm not talking about non-believers. Non-believers, they have nothing to look forward to. But as a believer, we're one step closer to seeing Jesus face to face. Now I know that doesn't, when you're in the midst of an emotional situation going through a loss, I know that's real. Not ever trying to take that away because every person applies himself or however it happens within that person, their makeup of the, of the person, they're going to, their emotions are going to be shown in different ways. Some more intently than others, some not as much. But the reality of it is, if we really believe that it's done deal, I mean, do we really want to, at you know, whatever age, let's just say we're, we're, we're 80 years old, do we really want to start taking all this other medication so we make it another two years and probably live in misery because those two years you know, our, our, uh, our, 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 the, the medicine's going to create a staff to be on another one, which is going to create a staff to be on another one, and then another one, and another one. You know, I mean, why would we really, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud. You hear what I'm saying? I'm not telling anybody what to do or not do regarding medications or health, and that's between you, the Lord, and the doctors, and y'all keep it there. Now I'll pray for you any way you want me to. But the reality is, is that we know that we are that close you know, even if we're not sick to the point of death at this moment in our life, we know that we don't, we're not promised tomorrow. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. We've got today. And I would rather today rejoice in my relationship with Jesus than to be grieved because I might have to leave this world a little early. Lord, come quickly. Solve all our problems. But it's His plan and it's His will. And verses 23 through 26. Then he will give the rain for your seed with which you sow the ground and bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plentiful. And that day your cattle will feed large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, which has been winnowed with the shovel and fan. They will be on every high mountain and on every high hill, rivers and streams of waters. In the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall, moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun. And the light of the sun will be sevenfold, as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. Comments, thoughts on these verses. I see this as something, yet it, it, it has partially happened to Israel when they were returned, after their punishment, they were returned to the land. Mm -hmm. And there was some, a level of blessing. But this is, part of this is future. I see it as part of the future, especially the light of the sun. There is part in Revelation that talks about the the whole earth being filled with the there won't be any light necessary need for sunlight because Jesus will be the light. Mm -hmm. So I see that this is partially future. 
Yeah. Going to heaven. But the, there's also great in repentance. There's a tremendous blessing. Yeah. In repentance. Hmm. It's a great incentive to get things right with the Lord because there's something good on the other side from like the idols we're holding on to. They're so worthless mm -hmm. compared to the glory that the Lord has for us. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And you think about it, it carries me back to the garden. You know, in the garden, I mean, yeah, he was to tend the garden. We know Adam was put in the garden. He was to tend it. But what did it mean to tend the garden of God? When Adam was there before the, before sin, I mean, I, I mean, I, my mind can go in all kinds of places. Were there even weeds? Did he have to weed the garden? He didn't have to water it. Rain had not fallen upon the earth. The water came up from the ground, and it watered all the plants and, and everything. All the vegetation was there. So when he says tend the garden, honestly. This is my. This, I have not done a word study on this, so I'm not. I'm not giving you an absolute here, but I kind of think it was more of when you when you are walking through the garden, you're you're observing, you're looking, you're you're touching, you're feeling, you're you're tending it. You're just there with it, but you're not really having to do a lot of work. But then what happened after the fall? You know, thorns and thistles. And the work and the ground is hard. And cuts it. And what's that? And cuts it. <laughs> and cuts it. And pours an ivy. You know? Yeah. All the vine, it just grows up over everything. It's it's amazing. And you know, this year, and I, I give a lot of praise to my wife because we planted a garden many years and she's not really been in a healthy place where she could tend it. Now she's tending it. I mean every single day. You know, our, our, it's, it's behind our workplace. We've got a big, big open field back there. So it's behind where I work. So I get to come in and go work in an air-conditioned place, and I'll pop my head out and now and then say, hey, you missed a spot, and then I'll come back in. And then I duck. You ain't never seen fly, a squash fly, have you? <laughs> it's fast. But she's been out there, and she tends it. But it's, you know, it's work. It's a lot of work. And, you know, prior to her, her being able to do that, when I would plant a garden, the weeds would take it. I didn't have the time, the energy, quite honestly, the desire to go out there and pull all those weeds. And this is the prettiest garden I've ever seen. It just looks nice, and it's coming along, and, and, and it's been tended to. All of these things where I'm due, but it's work. But when we see here, he'll give rain for your seed with which you will sow the ground and the bread of the increase of the earth. What I really believe is, like you said, I believe this is, is, is partly now. I do believe he's blessing the work that she's putting into it, the work of her hands. He's blessing that today. But I believe that it also applies to the end. You know, that, this, that it's not going to be, it's going to be the rain we need when we need it. It's going to be the bread of increase. It's going to be what it's supposed to be. And all of that is going to be God's blessing back upon his people and the fat it'll be fat and plentiful and your cattle will feed on large pastures likewise the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder i don't know what uncured fodder is i don't really want to know um but again it'll be uh, on every high mountain and every hill the rivers and streams and he will provide the water he'll provide everything and that's and again this puts us right back up into revelation in the end in that, the last chapters there where it talks about the, the ever stream of, of water and the trees. I mean, you know, this is, I mean, I honestly don't understand everything about the trees. And we had, I think we had a discussion about this not too long ago about the fruit because it <coughs> produces monthly. And, 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 okay, is it, you know, does every tree, I think there's 12 trees. I can't remember all the details. I believe there's like 12 trees there. Do they produce the same fruit? Is it all different fruit? I mean, but it's going to be consistent. And, and it's going to be there. And it's just, again, those streams. What I really like is the streams of water that are just flowing. And see, today, we have the Holy Spirit, which is often referred to as the living water that flows through us. And it's like a never-ending stream. You know, the only time you can cut off the stream of the Lord is when we turn the faucet off and we quench it. You've seen the water hoses, and they're doing real well, and all of a sudden you pull it and can't get in it. And you well, we can do that too, spiritually. We can have our hoses quenched, I mean, squinched, and we can just not let the, the water flow because we are in a place to where we're not wanting to receive it. Mm -hmm. We're back in the flesh again. Mm -hmm. 
we're back in that place. And so, um, so what God wants us to do is to keep in a place where that water of the Holy Spirit is flowing through us consistently. And think about it this way, too. If he's flowing through us consistently, it's not only going to flow into us, it's going to flow out of us. And then we will be effective as the brothers and sisters in the Lord were supposed to be because it's his water flowing through us, not our flesh getting in the way of it. Because the flesh can turn off a spigot in a heartbeat. Yeah. One yeah. thing I was thinking, thinking about the uh, uh, about the living water compared to the, the dead water or the not moving water. Mm. When you don't have a, a flowing water, which is the living water, when it's not flowing, that's when it starts collecting all the bacteria that's and everything it. else is not good. Yeah. And so when you don't have that living water flowing through you, you're you're basically dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's stagnant. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I can tell you from experience by hiking on the trails up in North Georgia and on the, up, well, on the Appalachian Trail all the way up to Virginia. When you go through there on a good rainy season, when it's been raining a lot, you have all kinds of flowing water you can pull from. Now, you still have to filter it. I definitely wouldn't recommend you not. But then you get in those drier spells and there's pools of water. And you see all those little mosquito buggy things floating, you know, floating in it. And, and it's murky. And you can filter it. But you can tell the difference. I had a water bottle that I had to throw out because I had used it one time in, a, in one of those pools, and it left an odor in that bottle even after we filtered. And we have the charcoal filters that you're pumping it with, and it's going through. And it was clean enough to drink, but I sure didn't want to. I had to at times because all we had. The dry, dry times up there, the water just didn't flow in. So you have to be careful where you go and plan ahead and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but when it's flowing water, it's cold. And there's nothing like walking along and taking your pack off and sticking your head in water that's flowing down out of the side of a mountain. I mean, that's, that's, I wish I had it right now. I don't want to have a pack on my back and I don't want to be in the mountains, but I wish I had that water flowing. But I do have the spirit, and we do too. And only we can quench that. Nobody can take it from us. Nobody can turn off our spigot. We're the only ones that can cannot do uh, what we're supposed to do by being open let the spirit flow any other thoughts on these verses <sighs> what came to my mind after reading this was Psalm 23 mm-hmm. Psalm 23 just kind of came to me as I was reading these verses because what it really gives us it's twofold. It gives us the fact that he is our shepherd now. The Lord is my shepherd. It doesn't say he's going to be my shepherd. He is my shepherd. I shall not want. And that tells us and puts us back into the perspective of what we're talking about here. When we're walking in with the Lord in relationship, he is our shepherd. We are not lacking anything. We're not lacking anything. We may not have everything we want, but we're not lacking anything. And it says he makes us to lie down in green pastures. Lying down in the green pastures. And you know, going back to the verses we just read, you know, the, 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 the animals will feed on, on green, full pastures, many large pastures. And I believe that we also, he puts us in these places where it's plentiful. It's not more than we need. And this is consistent. If you really look at God's consistency, he never gave Israel more than they needed. That dropped and I didn't even see it. Y'all didn't say a word either. I see how it is. Um, he, he gave them what they needed. The manna from heaven. One day supply up until the Sabbath. Then they got a two day supply. And if they ever hoarded it away, the flies and maggots, it turned rotted, ugly. And he told them, don't do it. And so they would only collect what they needed. He gives them what they need. He leads them beside still waters. Now, when we're talking about still waters, they're still flowing. There's still a flowing. It may not be rapids, but it's still flowing. There's a couple of places on the Etowah I cross over the bridge, and every time I cross it, I said, man, I'd love to go fish that spot. Because it's, it's flowing, but it's really calm and, and green and, and rich, unless it's raining and it's muddy. But, or if they let out the water from the dam, it fills up and it gets kind of cloudy. But when it settles down... It's just real calm and clean and, and really neat. It's still waters. He restores our soul. 
He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's leading us along. He's taking us moment by moment, day by day, in the path of righteousness. Everything we're reading in, in Isaiah here and what he's, the mercy that he's given them, we can see that he's giving us. And through this psalm, he's doing it even as we speak. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Again, goes back to what we're just talking about. You know, if we have uh, areas in our life or things that, you know, health-wise that we're worried about, we don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear evil. We don't have to fear anything. Because, honestly, death as a believer is just a shadow. And we talked about the shadow before when Israel went to Egypt for their help. It was a shadow of, of health. They didn't do anything. They couldn't do anything. Well, a shadow of death can't do anything either. If it takes us from this body, we're present with the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We will fear no evil for you are with me. God is with us. His rod and staff, they comfort us. And he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Now that's encouraging too. Because Jesus told us, you know, pray for your enemies. And he'll anoint, I mean, he will put like uh, uh, fire on their head, you know, uh, he uh, coals of fire upon their head. And so when you think about this, he's preparing a table for us in front of our enemies. When we are walking in relationship with Jesus in front of our enemies, it's preparing a table. He's preparing us to be with him, walking with him. And I can tell you that people see it. They see it. People are watching all the time. And he's preparing this table in the presence of the enemies. He anoints our head with oil. And I could just, I, I mean, I just picture this oil just, just running off our head, you know. The Holy Spirit, the oil, this, it's just a wonderful, wonderful uh, picture in my mind. Our cup runs over, and that goes back to what we were talking about a while ago. When the Spirit is flowing, it flows out of us. It, sp it spills out. We can't contain everything that God has for us, everything the Holy Spirit has for us. We can't contain it. These bodies, these minds, we can't even comprehend it. But he continues to pour in, even that of which we can't. We just we, we, we grab what we can, and the other flows off, and, and it flows out of us to other people. And they also are touched by the cup that runs over out of our lives. And surely good and goodness and mercy, they will follow us all the days of our life. Goodness and mercy. And what is the primary thing we've been talking about with, with Judah is mercy. God is merciful. And he's merciful to us. He's already expressed his mercy by sending Jesus Christ. That was the ultimate merciful gift he could give to us was, the, was his son. And Jesus going to that cross, the mercy he gave us, he took upon, out upon his own son. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's going to be fun. That's going to be fun. We'll be looking each other up. You know? I don't know how it's going to look. I mean, you know, again, we've been taught ever since kids, mansions and, you know, and Jesus even said, I go and prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, he wouldn't have told us. So he's preparing a place. I hope mine's a little log cabin overlooking Heaven's Mountains. But whatever he has, I'm going to be more than content with and satisfied with and overflowing with joy with because he's doing the providing. And we won't have any more of this stuff that hovers around us. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine, a guy I actually hiked with. We were talking on the phone today. We've, we've been talking about another hiking trip. Believe me, it's all talk right now. Because uh, he's working a lot more, and, and, and he told me, he said, this is going to really make your day. He said, because I don't know if I'm going to have time to go. And I said, whew. <laughs> but um, but we, were, uh, we were talking about, you know, the hiking, and we were talking about, uh, all, everything that comes along with it, the planning and everything, and I lost my complete train of thought. I don't know why I brought that up. <laughs> so that's just part of the day. But uh, by having the cabin, the cabin, yeah, having the cabin. Well, there's no cabin up there. There are some nice shelters, <laughs> but um, but anyway, if we go, we're going to be going. And we're going to be be doing you know pretty much what we always do: tent camping and going out and seeing all those things. But I know that anything that we see on these trails, God. God's got so, so much better than we can ever imagine. So much better than we can ever imagine. And I'm just, I'm thankful. I hope we're all thankful. Because Jesus tells us, the Word tells us, you know, come to me with the praise and thanksgiving in your heart. Come to Him with the th uh, praise and thanksgiving. Without those two things, 
It's all about us. It's all about us. But when we come with praise and thanksgiving, it's all about Him. Yes. And then He's free to do what we need and to work it all out. And I think I just remember what I was going to tell you. We were talking about, you know, you know, the reason that we struggle so much in this life is because we're never in control. And he brought up, you know, why do babies cry so much? They got it made. I said, well, they cry because they're not in control. They're completely dependent about somebody to feed them, change them, wash them, and the whole thing, and hold them, and rock them. And, and they're unhappy when they're not getting what they want. Then you get older, and you go to school, and then school controls you. You got everybody telling you, you can't do this, you can't do that, got to do this, got to do this, got to study math, algebra. <coughs> I don't have any of that. You know, but you got to do it. Then you get into college, same thing, it's standing up. Then you get a job. Now your boss is controlling you. You get married. Well, then your wife is controlling Or your husband is controlling You have no control. And then when you get older, what happens? You're basically going back to the baby stage if somebody's having to take care of you again. Change and clean you up, do the whole thing. No wonder we're miserable people if you look at life the way it is. We're never in control. This is why it's so important that we understand that God is in control. And when we're dependent upon Him, it doesn't matter what phase of life we're in. He's in control. He's got it. And He's going to take us where He wants us to go. And we need to learn to be content under His control. Because any other place, we're out of control. No matter what. Any last comments? Any last thoughts before we close? I have one. Yes. Um... Four years ago, July 3rd, I landed in Georgia by myself with my truck. And I said, God, I need a church. And I put it in his hands. And I, who knew it was going to be in an old schoolhouse? Mm. But I, I found this group of believers that are just amazing. But it's because I put it in his hands. Mm. I said, I give it over to you. Yeah. I remember you telling me you drove by. I drove by. Yeah. You saw the sign. You said, hmm. I tried to find it. I found her house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finding her house is easy. She's always out front keeping everybody in line in the neighborhood. Well, the dogs too. Yeah. yeah that's true. But, yeah, I mean, God brought you. And, and, and that's, that's one area of life. God takes us where he wants us to go spiritually, to grow, to be involved where he wants us to be. He puts people in our lives. But you have to be willing to, to go where he tells you to go. Yeah. Yes. Because that did not look like a church. Mm -hmm. But yeah. when I opened the door... And never you descended upon me. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing we have to also. Honestly, I just want to. I want to encourage you guys. If we do have visitors, don't swarm them. No, I felt so well. No, yeah, I know you did, and I'm, I'm teasing in a way, because honestly, we haven't had a lot of visitors, and and I'm praying that God would send us laborers, not just people to come through and go out, but that they would send us laborers. But but sometimes somebody comes in, it's like whoa. You know, Every it's like time. a new one. We got somebody new. And, uh, you know, we got to be careful that we don't overwhelm people. And, you know, they think, oh, you know, here's the thing, too. If they have kids, mm. let's don't tell them that they're bringing their own youth ministry with them because they're probably looking for a church that already has one. And they don't necessarily want to be the one to start one. It's just one of those things. But, hey, you know what? Love them. Just love the people that come and be who we are and let him do the work. Because God is faithful. He put us together for a purpose. If this, never, if this is all we have, exactly. hallelujah, mm -hmm. if this is what God wants for us. Because we have a neat little way of communicating. We have a way of understanding it. And everybody in here has got their own little things. I mean, their personality's different. Everything's different. But you know what? Uh, we can even love those in the back. I mean, we, <laughs> I mean, it, he's, he's faithful to us when we can love everybody. But the Holy Spirit's here. That's right. The Holy Spirit's here, and you yeah. feel it. If that's what you're looking for, yeah. it smacks you in the face, and that's the way yeah. I felt. When well, I, I appreciate you sharing that, and, I, and that's the way we want to stay. We want to be spirit-led. That was, that was pretty much a very simple <laughs> vision we had when we planted the church, you know. Stay in the Word, stay in prayer, and, and be spirit-led. And we don't need anything else than that. No. And he will do what he wants to do as he sees fit. So praise God and thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we do come tonight. We thank you for our time together. We pray, Lord, that this would penetrate our hearts. And, and if, we, if we leave here tonight, Lord, I pray we will leave with the understanding that in the midst of the adversity and troubled waters and whatever may come our way, if it's, it's, if it's from you, it's for our good. If it's not from you, what he means for evil will be turned to good. Right. 
And so, Lord, we, we can depend upon that. We can trust upon that because that's your word. And we can have the life today of peace and joy. And we can have the fruits of the Spirit flowing through us because we have access to you through the Holy Spirit, through your word, we, and through Jesus, through what you did on the cross. We have access to the Father, and we can go behind the veil. We can go behind the veil and be in the Shekinah glory. Lord, we have access. I know that many times we don't really want to take that much time to find ourselves to get to that place, Lord. I think it's a uh, quick prayer here, quick prayer there. And, Lord, I'm guilty. I think we all are. We have life, and it gets in the way. But, Lord, it doesn't have to. And we choose today to put you first in every area of our life, get rid of any of the idols, listen to the Word, listen to the Holy Spirit, listen to prophecy, listen to to whatever may, you may be speaking, however you see fit to speak to us. We want to hear, we want to be opening to listen, and then we want to obey. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 And amen. Could I ask us to...